Okay, so a very good afternoon to the fellow panelists, Prof. Scott, Prof. Ravika, and Dr. Rushdi, our advisors for this event, Prof. Khaldun and Dr. Munawa, the president of Malaysian Society of Toxinology and acting in charge for the special interest group of clinical toxinology, Dr. Sabrina, and the fellow students. Welcome to our webinar entitled Clinical Toxinology and is it relevant for, its med for the medical students. We will start our event with the welcome note by Prof. Kaldun. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you, uh, Brian. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our uh, first webinar for such a topic uh, for medical students uh, in Malaysia. And uh, we are actually uh, doing this during our emergency medicine uh, posting in, in UKM. So uh, rather than giving a very dry lecture, uh, we decide that uh, a forum will be uh, more beneficial and more interesting, especially in the afternoon. And we will have uh, our expert panelists uh, to give their uh, thoughts uh, and to answer some of your uh, to answer the questions that you will pose uh, during this uh, webinar. So uh, for your information, um, I think uh, during the forum, all questions uh, from uh, the students and participants can be directed uh, uh, towards the uh, panelists uh, during, the webin during the forum. And please uh, key in your questions uh, in the chat box, okay? Is it okay? Please uh, type your question in the chat box and the moderators will direct the questions to the uh, expert panelists. So welcome and uh, uh, sit back and uh, enjoy the ride. I hope we will have a very uh, fruitful and uh, interesting uh, afternoon uh, today. Okay, with that, I thank you. Back to you, Brian. Okay, so uh, I'll be starting to just give a brief talk on this topic prior to the Q&A sessions. So uh, yeah, this is our topic for today, clinical toxinology, and is it relevant to medical students? And uh, my name is Brian, and I'm the student representative uh, for this event. Uh, so yeah, toxinology is the scientific study of substances produced by living organisms, either delivered as venom or residing within tissues of animals, plants, mushrooms, and bacteria which may harm target organisms. Toxinology is an established field of science and clinical toxinology is an applied translational subfield of this diverse and amazing discipline. In other words, clinical toxinology is a specialized area of clinical medicine focused on the pathophysiology, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of diseases caused by animals, plants, mushrooms, and bacteria. In Okay, uh, these are two common uh, terms which we commonly use, which is envenomation versus poisoning and poisoning. Envenomation is the exposure to venom containing toxins resulting from bites or stings from venomous animals. Poisoning, on the other hand, is the administration of a poison containing natural toxins inside one's body via swallowing, inhalation or absorption through the skin. So in simpler terms, uh, envenomation happens when a venomous animal bites you or stings you. And for uh, poison, poisoning, for, on the other hand, is for example, if uh, one eats like a mushroom without knowing that it's poisonous, uh, that is poisoning. Uh, yeah, we, these are two common terms which we frequently misuse, which is toxinology and toxicology. Toxicology is our topic today, and toxicology is the study of adverse effects. Toxicology is study of adverse effects caused by any chemical or radiation on living systems. Okay, does clinical toxicology exist in Malaysia? So there are a few associations available in Malaysia, which include uh, MST, which is the Malaysian, Malaysian Society of Toxicology, which, is, which has been established in 1992. RECS, which is a Remote Envenomation Consultancy Service, which has been established in 2010. And the third one is the Clinical Toxinology SID College of Emergency Physicians, which has been established in 2010. What is RECS? RECS is a Risk Management and Support System. It has been uh, uh, 
established to assist healthcare professionals at various levels of clinical management for bites, stings, cases from venomous animals, and for and poisoning from natural occurring toxins. It is also a 24-hour on-call consultation service and training provider, mainly but not exclusively for healthcare professionals since 2010. The main objective of this organization is to enhance a favorable outcome by optimizing and advocating appropriate treatment modalities at every level of our clinical management. Is, is this topic important in Malaysia? Uh, we all know that uh, Malaysia is a tropical country which is rich in biodiversity. Okay, and it's not really uncommon for us to have cases like snake bites, mushroom poisonings, marine related envenomation, and arthropods envenomation. So uh, are these are these which this topic is actually being taught in medical schools in Malaysia? Uh, I for us we 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 will not very sure when it has been uh, started, but currently it is part of our emergency posting, and uh, yeah, it's currently part of our emergency posting. But after further going into all this uh, this topic, uh, we pretty much agree that. And uh, that it should be established on the next batch, uh, upcoming batches for us to introduce this topic into uh, this posting as well. Okay, uh, the next is the student's perception regarding clinical toxinology. Okay, prior, prior to us having this webinar, we, uh, we basically thought that clinical toxinology is a very superficial topic. We only knew that it's as simple as as simple as a snake or a, a, a venomous bite, but after uh, watching all the lectures and all the materials that have been given to us, we've been amazed that it's really a broad topic, and there's actually a lot for us to learn about this. Okay, the next is the importance of clinical toxicology for medical students. Yes, uh, we and my fellow uh, friends agree that. Us being in this hospital, which is Hospital UKM, which is in a city, we, it is rare that we see cases uh, come into emergency department uh, having snake bites or any venomous bites. But it's because we live, this is a hospital which is in the city. But for example, if in the future, if we, we are a houseman or anything, we have, been, we have been posted to much more rural areas, such as Sabah or Sarawak, we might encounter more cases like this. So it's good that we equipped ourselves with sufficient basic knowledge regarding this topic so that, that in the future, we will know how to manage, how, what's the basic management for a patient who presents with a venomous bite uh, or, or, or anything related to this topic to the hospital. Because we know that it can be life-threatening and it's also an emergency case. So it's good that we equip ourselves with knowledge regarding this topic. Okay. Uh, and the best, the, the next is the best time and the way for us to learn this topic is uh, like for us, we are doing it now in our emergency medicine postings. And uh, we should also try to learn things like this during our family medicine posting as well. Yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank yeah. you, Brian. I think that's a very good uh, uh, introduction to uh, to start off our forum today. So uh, I will actually uh, just inform everybody here that uh, we have experts uh, uh, in the field of uh, toxicology and toxinology uh, here with us, uh, uh, good friends of mine as well, uh, my mentor, uh, Prof. Scott from Adelaide, uh, he's, he's a New Yorker, but he's uh, posted in uh, Adelaide at the moment, uh, but uh, uh, I think he's moving back to the US soon I, I, from what I heard. So we are actually in a very, we are very lucky today to have him because uh, he's very busy in the transition of moving back to the US. So thank you, Prof. Scott for joining us. 
And I would like to also inform everybody that uh, this is uh, uh, specifically mainly for medical students. Uh, and in UKM, uh, the medical students uh, doing this posting in emergency department is in their uh, final year. Uh, so uh, part of the so-called primary care uh, uh, attachment, and that includes with the family medicine as well. So uh, that's where uh, Prof Scott comes in because he's also a family medicine uh, specialist. So it will be very interesting to see this combination uh, uh, being discussed today. So uh, just also to inform everyone, uh, before we started uh, this uh, program today, everybody uh, in the medical uh, posting uh, had been given a task. And uh, some of these tasks include uh, watching uh, some of the previous webinars uh, related to the topic that we have. So that saves us time uh, from uh, you know, providing another boring lecture <laughs> for today. So they have already seen all the necessary videos uh, related to clinical toxinology introduction. And uh, today we are going to discuss a bit more in depth uh, about the importance of clinical toxinology in medical uh, uh, curriculum. So uh, without further delay, I would like to invite uh, our two moderators for today's forum uh, to proceed with our program. Um. Good afternoon uh, to our fellow panelists, uh, Prof. Scott, uh, Dr. Rushdi, and also Dr. Uh, so we'll be with uh, expecting questions to flow. Uh, so let's, uh, let's hope there'll be some questions coming in soon. Okay, uh, I'll introduce uh, the panelists. So um, we'll start with Prof. Scott. Uh, Prof. Scott Weinstein is a clinical toxinologist, family physician, and a herpetologist. His experience in clinical toxinology includes comprehensive uh, treatment of envenomy, mushroom and poisonous plant intoxication and identification of the evidence-based risk of venomous snakes of little known medical importance. And we also have um, Prof. Dr. Ravika Rao. He's a professor of medicine at the Christian Medical College and Hospital in Vellur, India. He completed his postgraduate training in internal medicine from Christian Medical uh, college in 2012. He's the recipient of numerous awards, including four medals for exemplary, exemplary clinical performance in the state university, postgraduate degree examinations. At CMC, Dr. Ross is primarily involved with the clinical care of patients with poisonings and envenomings, undergraduate and postgraduate medical training and research. He has authored and co-authored peer-reviewed papers, mainly in the areas of clinical toxicology and infectious disease. Um, Dr. Ralph also coordinates activities at the CMC Poisons Information Center, which supports healthcare providers and the general public with information related to poisonings, bites, and stings. At the regional level, Dr. Ralph has been closely involved with health policy issues concerning snake bite mitigation in South Asia. He has served as leader member of WHO Zero Expert Group, assembled to formulate a guidance document to implement the WHO Global Strategy for the Prevention and Control of Snake Bite and Venom with strong emphasis on regional concerns and is currently a member of the WHO Global Roster of Experts and Technical Advisory Group on the Prevention and Control of Snake Bite. Okay, and we also have another panelist, uh, Dr. Mohamad Rushdi Ahmad Rusmeli. He is currently an assistant professor at the Department of Basic Medical Sciences, Kulia of Pharmacy, Kuantan Campus, International Islamic University, Malaysia, IIUM. He obtained his... Um, a uh, Bachelor of uh, Pharmacy degree from IIUM and later he did his PhD. He obtained his PhD from Monash University. His doctoral research mainly involves the utilization of proteomics technology and pharmacological techniques to identify and characterize neurotoxic activity of great venoms and toxins. His research interests are mainly on the effect of exotic venoms, the efficacy of antivenom, Characterization of novel proteins from venom and their potential applications. Okay, those are, um, those are, pan those are our panelists. I hope uh, our students will, you know, get gain more knowledge from them. Okay, can maybe uh, we have uh, our uh, expert panelists to give a, a brief comment uh, about the introduction uh, presentation just now by Brian. Uh, so uh, maybe we can invite Prof. Uh, Scott first to say 
few words, opening words on the presentation just now. Good. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the privilege of being here. It's uh, very happy to, and also with the company. Um, I would make a couple of comments about the very nice presentation, which was a good synopsis. The only thing I would warn everyone to be careful about, which I know uh, Cal is also quite aware of, is just the terminology involved in this, which actually is becoming more of an issue as this science grows and becomes more interdisciplinary, which is one of, I think, the important topics here. To make what would be a very, very long story short for the moment, um, the key is, is when you point out that there are effects from an animal biting a human, for example, and then that if the effects are detrimental, that potentially means that the animal's venomous. That's too general of a term because the term venomous is misused in a very, very um, obvious and increasingly blatant way, particularly in the literature. If, for example, many persons here and watching also have seen patients presenting with dog bites and human bites, and there's lots of humans. We usually use our teeth and our oral secretions to pre-digest food and to also uh, taste things. But some humans, as we know, use them in self-defense and even in offense. And, and the ancestors were pronathus. So that might mean that we had a different functional uh, use for our buccal cavity in the past, being the primates that we are and the, the territoriality that we still exhibit and the tribalism we still exhibit. So. Chihuahuas biting a person will cause detrimental effects and some of those effects will be toxic because their saliva contains many of the classes of biologically active substances and proteins that we see in snake venom. Some of them are shared classes, proteases, phospholipases, uh, histatins, uh, all different types. In human mouth, we have alpha kynurenic acid, which is a product of tryptophan metabolism and is an excitatory peptide, meaning it's an excitatory neurotoxin. So what makes an animal venomous? It's really their use of their buccal substances, their oral products in the subjugation capture of prey. And in some species, possibly secondarily as an anti-predator mechanism. But we can't define a venomous animal by their effects on us because we have no evidence, no matter what several people have, have asserted, we have no evidence that they evolved these substances in response to our presence. They don't care if we exist or not. They evolved these substances in order to obtain a larger biomass of prey with less bio expenditure effort so that they get a net benefit from the risk of a retaliatory interaction with a prey item. So that would be my main point to make initially that in other words, the main carryaway point is we don't really have anything called a venomous bite. What we have is a medically significant injury from a venomous animal. That's a very different thing to say. That just would be my first statement about that. Uh, great. So, uh, great. so uh, maybe Ravika would like to give a few comments about, uh, about the topic. Um, well, um... First of all, I, I really feel that um, uh, this is something that is uh, that has been in waiting for a long time. Um, and uh, as far as uh, you know, India and Malaysia uh, are concerned, we have common problems both in terms of snake bite as well as um, uh, you know the great lack um, as far as the treatment is concerned. Uh, in the smaller hospitals where these snake bite victims go. Um, and uh, I'd like to, uh, rather than adding anything to what Brian has already presented, I'd, I'd just like to sort of um, resonate with a few points that he made. One being uh, the fact that, uh, you know, just like what he's presented, uh, we again see that there's an oversimplification um, of, um, uh, of toxinological problems, which uh, in both India and Malaysia, the bulk of which would be snake bites. Um, and, uh, you know, there is this sort of um, uh, 
equation where if a person comes with a snake bite, you just give antivenom. Um, and the same thing happens with poisonings as well in India, where a person comes with any sort of pesticide and he just gets atropine. So there is basically a lack of a clinical component. People seem to forget that snake bites are complex clinical diseases as well. Um, and I, I think that very rightly so, the source of this problem lies in um, the uh, undergraduate education system. So I, I really feel that this is a topic that um, uh, has been waiting for a long time to uh, actually evolve and bear fruit. Um, and uh, I would really sort of agree with the points that uh, were made in the presentation. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Ravika. Can we have uh, also a few words from uh, 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 System Prof. Uh, uh, Rushti? Assalamualaikum and good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, committee, uh, committee members, for inviting me. Uh, by the way, I need to uh, emphasize I'm not a medical doctor, so and my, my background is pharmacy. So I have very, very limited uh, knowledge on the curriculum, but uh, from my, what I heard, it's almost similar as pharmacy because in pharmacy school, we also teach clinical toxicology in year four. It's, application, it's, it's uh, applied or elective subject. Okay. Uh, so uh, is it irrelevant? Of course, it's relevant, especially in places where I stay, in Kuantan, especially where we got sea, got jungle, we got everything here. Okay. So from what I see, the, the problem is not. Uh, uh, whether it's relevant or not, is how much you need to know. Because when I talk about clinical toxicology, it's very, very localized knowledge. Because you don't, maybe you some of the species is very localized in your area. Okay, I was like, uh, in my place in Kuantan, I today I just uh, found a pit viper near to my office. Uh, so. Uh, so I, at least I know is a I know pit viper is around near to my office. So there's a risk of pit by pit viper bite near to my office. So this kind of knowledge is very important. Uh, so as a medical student, I expect when if let's say I got bitten, uh, those medical students will know uh, or medical student or doctors will know how to treat me. That's the most important. Okay, uh, at least they know from the pharmacist's point of view. At least, okay, uh, you all, because you are the one who will decide what kind of stocks of the venom that need to be stored with the advice of the pharmacist later. So, uh, with that kind of uh, mentality at the moment, so we need your output, okay, say uh, what type of antivenom, how much you need later. So, that kind of information is really required. Uh, for me, for my pharmacist, uh, student letter, uh, they will need that information to allow them to give, uh, to give better service to you. Thank you so much. I think that's all for me. Great, thank you. Uh, that's a very, uh, I think, uh, insightful uh, information from a pharmacist's uh, perspective, uh, which is actually very closely related to the medical service. So uh, maybe before we move on, since uh, uh, this is about uh, academic uh, issues as well, so what, what do you think? Uh, is, there, is there a kind of a clinical toxinology specific, uh, moly, mo, uh, what do you call, um, uh, curriculum uh, installed, uh, for example, in Australia or in India or uh, in uh, Malaysia, IUM? How, 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 how do you see uh, clinical toxinology in uh, medical curriculum? Uh, Prof. Scott? Well, I tell you, that's a, a critical and essential question that I think is going to persist for some time because it, it's a, as you know, uh, it's a, this is really a young science by being defined as it is. It's very interdisciplinary. And as uh, Ravikar pointed out, it's often neglected in some regions because of all the other issues we know, there's very little money that goes into some areas of medicine because of the great preponderance of the need in some, and also because of the lack of political involvement of others. Now, the issue with clinical toxinology as a standing clinical discipline, and medical students ought to be aware of this, you always really need to choose the things that you find passionate and the way you want to intervene to help people, because that's going to translate into humane, and compassionate and effective evidence-based practice. That might be gastroenterology. It could be motility disorders among that. It could be anything that you can think of. But the key is, is to be aware that there might be limitations on what you need to do. And that means you have to do the classic prosaic light your own corner. Many people in this field, 
and Cal is a classic example of this, that has created their own network because there was no existing structure beforehand that really accommodated the need that was present in the country. And Ravikar certainly knows this very, very well in India where there's such a disparate area. Uh, many, many, the medical schools have different standards and different expectations and many of them aren't linked to each other even though they're dealing with the same problems. And so there's a, a, a heterogeneity of dealing with this very serious problem. Um, I think the key fact to get involved in this is that we need to have more of a kind of a recognition by an existing medical college, the way preventative medicine was taken in the United States underneath the wing of pediatrics or emergency medicine, and then worked into the main college where you get that umbrella of support. And then you get all the developed diploma programs that have academy recognition and stimulates more interest from the medical students who are hopefully participating. Again, you've got to be part of that. You've got to build it. Because if you don't have an involvement from the ground up, then there's no population of practicing physicians, pharmacists, allied health professionals that are engaged in this subdisciplinary area that then translates into much better outcomes for patients. That'd be a start. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, can, I can certainly vouch for that because uh, we were in a very uh, so-called uh, dark uh, mood in, at that time that uh, even for myself as a specialist at the time was really in the dark. Uh, and uh, we are in a tropical country, Malaysia particularly. Uh, we have so many diverse uh, fauna and flora that can cause harm to humans and patient comes to us with signs and symptoms of both envenoming and poisoning. We have no idea how to treat them. So that, that kind of, uh, that is actually the one that stimulated me to, to start, a, a, you know, to look into deeper into this and uh, to start a program for medical students at the time and also uh, build up a network, as you said. Uh, of, of uh, like-minded people and that's how RECs come about. So anyway. I, um, I just might yeah. want to add one thing to that that you can comment on, it's important. And that is that also led to the linkage to remote sites where a lot of these fights occur. Yeah, exactly. So uh, <laughs> uh, we are in the tropics. So a lot of uh, communities are still far away from uh, the, the help that they probably uh, can get. And I think, uh, for example, in India, uh, maybe Ravika can also comment about this. They have such a difficulty in uh, accessing to uh, 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 medical care in general, uh, uh, much worse to the uh, the optimal clinical toxinology care for patient. Maybe Ravika would like to say something about this access uh, to service. Um, I, I, I just have three uh, points to make. Um, uh, the, the first part actually pertains to um, how complex uh, the situation as far as medical education is concerned in India. And this all goes back, uh, you know, several years, um, you know, uh, maybe from the 1930s onwards. Uh, if you look at the Indian medical curriculum for the undergraduate medical student, um, most of the topics that come under toxicology are actually taught by the Department of Forensic Medicine. And uh, while they are specialists in forensic medicine, uh, they really don't have the clinical perspectives, uh, which can sort of be then transmitted to students. Um, and I personally think that that is one of the reasons why there is this sort of, if I may use the word, simplification of toxicology. Um, uh, and, and this is something that is really deeply in, entrenched in the system. Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, it it's, it's going to change very soon. Uh, and so whatever happens in India will have to happen uh, taking a route that's parallel to what you, you we can't really reverse something that has already been prescribed uh, by the council. The second problem which I find in India, which might be there in Malaysia, is when we look at the structure of the curriculum and the textbooks that are used, uh, they are based on the Western system of knowledge and diseases that really ail people in other parts of the world. And, uh, you know, as a result of which snake bite and other problems, which are, uh, you know, which have all the, which have all the qualities of uh, being highly pertinent and highly important. They are reversible problems. They affect young people. They just sort of disappear, you know, amongst the chapters on multiple sclerosis and other things that a medical student might never see. Uh, and so those are the two major problems as far as India is concerned. 
and combined with this is the fact that it is this medical student who is going to be posted then in uh, you know these small peripheral centers he has never seen a snake bite patient or perhaps he's seen one snake bite patient where some antivenom was given and all he knows is that if a person comes and tells you that it's a snake bite you just give antivenom he he has no clue how uh, you know you can manage complications of antivenom or what are the different syndromes mm, and as dr karl mentioned this is just one component of the problem in india the other component is access to medical care itself um, in fact um, uh, there are a number of studies that have shown that 70% of all snake bite patients in india actually die outside a hospital they aren't able to reach a hospital and um, uh, and i um, uh, personally can vouch for this fact because we have a number of patients who actually come to our center uh, from uh, distances that are as far as 100 kilometers away um, and we've had people who have stopped at three smaller centers on the way either have been refused treatment with antivenom or the center didn't have antivenom and by the time they reach us they are moribund they have bled into the brain you really can't do much uh, so this is a very, very grave problem. It results in a lot of, uh, you know, it changes the lives of people around. It, it impacts them. And I really feel that the greatest problem is invisibility. And I think that forums like these are very important to make such problems visible. Right. Thank you. That's that's <laughs> that's exactly what we are actually facing in the past 10 or 20, uh, 15 years ago uh, when we started this project. And uh, it is correct that, uh, you know, some of these uh, issues are actually really built up on the capacity of the country ability to, to provide care. And that uh, in Malaysia, for example, uh, as I can vouch, is, uh, emergency medicine is still quite young. It's actually one of the youngest uh, specialty uh, in, in medicine. Uh, and uh, pre-hospital care was actually part and parcel of that and uh, we are actually still developing the pre-hospital care as well in, in Malaysia and uh, I can uh, say that uh, we have seen tremendous um, improvement uh, over the past maybe 10 years when uh, uh, a lot of uh, budgets and efforts are being put into this area of uh, primary care uh, so that patients uh, can actually uh, uh, what do you call access to such care uh, sometimes, uh, you know, as you know, a snake bite may cause uh, somebody stop breathing, right? Uh, but if you are able to have people uh, knowing how to do CPR, provide, uh, you know, uh, basic life support, uh, this can actually uh, help a lot uh, in terms of minimizing uh, death uh, cases. So uh, uh, on that note of uh, uh, what you call a different country may have need different approach to uh, to this subject maybe dr rushdi would like to comment because he has some experience uh, both in malaysia and outside of malaysia how different uh, 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 the topic could be uh, in terms of uh, medical curriculum uh, for students should we just use as rabika said you know take the whole you know bible of so called toxinology or should we really look into uh, more specific to the country's need or, or picture of uh, available fauna and flora that can cause harm uh, to human. Uh, first of all, I agree with Dr. Ravika. There's a very urgent need to develop a localized knowledge on the local faunas. Uh, not faunas, just fauna and flora. Okay, because uh, uh, toxinology also involves plants, fungi, bacteria, and etc. etc. Okay, so again. Because in our, let me show you a story. When I did my bachelor in pharmacy back then, okay, uh, we have zero knowledge. We had to have what one hour lecture on uh, snake bite. That's it by a parasitologist. Okay, uh, back then, even they do, the anti venom that we know, they all come from India. Why? Because it's cheap. Pharmacies at the back then they will choose the cheapest one. Uh, okay, uh, that's the reason why back then they kind of know this. But then a lot of antivenom being stored in our hospitals uh, actually come from India, okay? Especially antivenom for, for cobras, okay? Uh, and our when we got calls from medical officers in the hospital, so uh, we in the hospital you should know that there should be a drug information services. So what doctor can do that you can call these drug information services, and they can ask pharmacy for uh, pharmacies for the advice. Yeah, okay, in case of toxicity or envenoming or poisoning. So most of the reference that we had before was Macromedex from the US. So the only snake bite that we can see in the system was rattlesnake, 
and also the chorus deck. That's it. So, so the treatment was based on those. So that's why I don't kind of experience this. So <laughs> pharmacy sometimes give bad advice too. Uh, so that's why uh, when I came back from Australia last time, then I realized there's a need for uh, for emphasizing this knowledge to the pharmacy student. Okay, at least they know what anti venom to stock in the hospital. Uh, at least they know what will be the minimum amount, what the need, the, what will be the species that need, they need to stock. Okay, because some space, uh, some places like mine in Kuantan, we do have sea snakes, a lot of sea snakes. Okay, uh, then we have also cobras, pit vipers, you name it. So we have everything here. So definitely there's a need for more antidotes here compared to other places. Okay, uh, so this kind of knowledge is uh, what makes, uh, is basically, basically what we required in our curriculum, not only in medical, but also in pharmacy or maybe in nurse, nursing too. Okay, because yeah. they are the one also involved in the treatment anyway. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, from other countries, I think the same happened too, because I went to Morocco last time, same thing happened. So the when they have, Envenoming, they only at that time they only they rely on uh, anti venom from France is because they have uh, basically as uh, they don't have the capability to uh, make their own anti venom at that time. I went to Morocco last time uh, to re-establish the capability of making anti venom using the pandemic technology, but I think we failed uh, due to budget constraint. Uh, again, same same thing happened. So localized knowledge somehow is not utilized in the management of envenoming or poisoning. Okay, uh, so in back then in Morocco, the most concerning will be the scorpion. Uh, mm -hmm. Then, uh, then they have a lot of scorpion stings back then. I think the the uh, the conclusion for my the question uh, the, the conclusion will be we need to develop our localized knowledge on the local flora and fauna. Uh, then you mm -hmm. know what to. Uh, do and to treat later. Yeah, exactly. So that was what our worst battle before, <laughs> before we have our own uh, uh, what you call CPG, clinical practice guideline uh, on how to manage, for example, snake bite. Uh, we we still, uh, you know, as you know, uh, these uh, incidences of bites and stings are actually a disease of on its own. And, you know, a snake bite is a separate even then a different species of snake bite. We'll have a different approach on actually clinical management as well. So uh, you can't you know, just use one uh, you know recipe to 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 treat for every one of them. So this is something that uh, we realized, and that's what happened uh, at, uh, uh, more than ten years ago. That we uh, back in two thousand and fifteen and sixteen, we we come up with our own uh, national guideline for snake bite, and from then on, when we have. Uh, uh, the the Ministry of Health on board uh, in 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 uh, in providing this guideline, then it is much easier to so called have a standardized reference uh, uh, to the right uh, or to the appropriate uh, treatment for that country for our own country. So there's a bit of a, a variation uh, in terms of some of the treatment management and so on from the WHO guideline for snake bite. So uh, I understand that some of the principles, they could be the same, but uh, the actual specifics uh, will need uh, input from each country. And even in the country, each even states of the country have uh, different uh, fauna and flora. So they have different uh, maybe uh, approaches to managing the case. So uh, before we move on, uh, we have a nice and interesting uh, study uh, done uh, by our students in Sarawak. Uh, so, uh, maybe uh, Brian or Vanny can play this uh, video of their presentation, a short video of their presentation, before we can proceed with the question and answer. This is more of a uh, get a feel of how medical students' perspective or perception uh, about uh, 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 one of the aspects of clinical toxinology, uh, which is uh, snake bite. Vanny, Brian? I am Amirul Hakim a medical student from UNIMAS, and together with me are Esmeralda Mihan and Mirza Izati. Our supervisor is Professor Dr. Gabriel, and co-supervisors are Professor Dr. Mizanur and Associate Professor Dr. Khaldun. I would like to thank Dr. Khaldun to give us the opportunity to present our research today entitled Perceptions on Awareness, Knowledge and Confidence in Providing Information 
and management of snake-related injuries by medical students in Sarawak, Malaysia. The study was initially done to fulfill the university elective course and currently had been approved for publish in the Medicine and Health Journal. So this is the outline for today's presentation. The World Health Organization, WHO, has categorized snake-related injuries as a neglected tropical disease which can cause permanent disability or worse, can lead to death if not treated timely and appropriately. In 2019, the WHO estimated around 4.5 to 5.4 million snake bite cases worldwide annually. In Malaysia, the Ministry of Health acknowledged the importance of identifying Malaysian snake species for appropriate treatment and addressed the lack of data on snake bites in Malaysia. Snakes of medical importance that are usually found in Malaysia are from the Ilapidae, Viperidae, Colubridae and Phytonidae families, and the most commonly encountered species are Naja Kautia and Naja Sumatrana. The public's awareness in Malaysia has been initiated by Remote and Venomation Consultancy Services, Rex, and the Malaysian Society of Toxinology, MST, but awareness among medical students remain vague. Medical students are exposed to snake bites patients, predominantly in their clinical years and depending on the location of their medical postings. Hence, the study aimed to determine the perception of awareness, knowledge, and confidence level in providing instructions among Unimas medical students regarding snake-related injury and to compare the difference in perception between preclinical and clinical medical students. Besides addressing the perceived knowledge gap, this study would allow students to explore and generate interest in the importance of health-seeking behavior after a snake-related injury and ways to seek appropriate knowledge regarding SRI. For materials and method, the study was designed as quantitative cross-sectional questionnaire study where it uh, conducted from December 2020 to April 2021. For study setting, it was conducted at Faculty of Medicine and Health Science Unimas at Kota Samarahan, Sarawak. For study population, it involved 737 medical students of medical faculty at Unimas. And then, for the sample size, we use Kretzi and Morgan formula, where it involved 169 samples of preclinical students at Unimas and 205 samples of clinical students at uh, Unimas. And then, uh, the data was collected uh, through Google Form, and then the questionnaire was measured using Likert scale. For data entry and analysis, the data were directly stored in Microsoft Excel Office 2019 and then imported to IBM SPSS 2020 for further analysis. Alright, so we're moving on to our results. So majority of our respondents are female compared to male and they age between 21 to 22 years old. So as you can see in the graph, Majority of our respondents are from the preclinical and early clinical years, which is year 3 and year 4. As you can see, clinical students' perceptions on awareness are higher compared to preclinical students, for example, SRI as a medical emergency, minimizing SRI complications by using appropriate first aid, and the awareness on the existence of International Snake Bite Awareness Day. Clinical students' perception on confidence level is higher compared to preclinical students in terms of performing basic life support, how to manage the affected eyes after a snack venom has been sprayed into them, and also providing important history details that needs to be obtained following SRI. Clinical students' perception on confidence level is higher compared to preclinical students in terms of performing basic life support, how to manage the affected eyes after a snack venom has been sprayed into them, and also providing important history details that needs to be obtained following SRI. To summarize, the perceptions of clinical students 
on awareness, knowledge, and confidence level in providing information and management of snack-related injuries are higher compared to preclinical students. For discussion, we have explored awareness of public health measures, such as awareness of existing risk management support system like remote evaluation and consultancy services, and acknowledge the effort of World Health Organization in commemorating September 19 as International Snack Bite Awareness Day. Secondly, we have discussed the level of perceived knowledge that may differ from one population of medical students to another population of medical students. So this may be due to exposure of clinical settings along with the precise significance of basic first aid measures, for example, like pressure bandaging. Thirdly, we have explored the level of perceived confidence level differs from clinical student and preclinical student. This is possibly due to the exposure to snake bite, uh, snack related injury during clinical postings and experience of handling first aid measures like pressure bandaging. Now, in conclusion, medical students are still lacking in the knowledge, awareness, and confidence level in providing instruction on the appropriate safety and health seeking behavior for snack related injury. Although the clinical medical students' perception are slightly better compared to the pre clinical students, as they might have been exposed to the clinical settings or encounter snake bite cases but not a formal lecture on snake bite management. Hence, there is a need to recommend the integration of snake bite management to be included in the curriculum of uh, UNIMAS so that we can prepare medical students for their practice as future doctors. For further reading, the study has been accepted for publication and can be accessed for those who are interested. That's all from us. Thank you. Okay, great. I think uh, that, that gives us a bit of a summary of, uh, of about our topic today and the importance of it. And uh, we are actually uh, looking at um, uh, sort of like reintroducing uh, this topic into the medical curriculum because uh, during my time in the past, I, I studied uh, in, in Ireland and there was no reason why we should have a topic on snake bite because there's no snakes in Ireland, right? But when I came back to Malaysia, uh, that's where the problem start. I, I have no idea at all until I met a patient who got bitten by a snake and I have no idea about this snake. And, and that's why, uh, that's how I and Scott got in touch. I contacted Scott, he's uh, the person that uh, tell me about the snake, which is not dangerous. And we made a publication about this case report. That was my first case report that I did uh, as a medical officer when I came back from Ireland. So, uh, and from then on, we had a lot more, uh, you know, uh, studies done and uh, courses done and efforts to improve the, the, this topic among medical students. So we hope that the, the future doctors uh, following this effort uh, will be more uh, aware and a bit more confident in, in managing cases. And the most important, I think, is the support that they can get from uh, if they have uh, problems in actually uh, having doubts on how to manage a case. Uh, doesn't mean just snake bite, but in clinical toxinology as a whole now, uh, I, I'm not sure of how to treat, for example, a spider bite, uh, a centipede bite, uh, you know, which was in the past was taken very lightly, but can actually, we know uh, from our experience in managing these cases can actually cause some, some problems, especially in the younger and the elderly age group. So uh, this is where our knowledge about uh, the, the topic on clinical toxinology can actually help. And uh, the, the efforts from Rex, the, one of the most important efforts of Rex is actually to provide uh, the support for the uh, appropriate care so that we can obtain an optimal outcome for patient management. So that is actually, we are fighting for patients, uh, you know, fighting for patients' rights, basically, uh, by providing this uh, support to the doctors treating them. So, uh, for example, in Malaysia in the past, uh, this topic were taught during a parasitology parasitology session. Uh, what, uh, what has snake got to do with the parasite? I know snakes contains parasite, but snakes itself is not a parasite. So that is a bit of a, you know, uh, uh, strange uh, combination there because nobody else are actually taking the effort to teach a medical student a bit about, uh, you know, snakes, what the snakes are and so on. So parasitology took it up because they deal with so-called animals. Uh, I don't know how, but uh, that's how it got stuck in parasitology. And 
I think uh, since uh, a few years ago, this was not taught anymore. And that's where uh, the new curriculum of medical school, having uh, medical students uh, posting uh, posted in emergency department and uh, family medicine, this uh, primary care, and that's where the interest started to, to, to come again. And uh, we hope uh, maybe in the next few years, uh, this uh, can be taken up uh, to form a sort of like national curriculum, uh, basic support uh, for clinical toxinology for medical students uh, uh, in, in their respective uh, institutions. So uh, I think that's all from me for the moment. So we, we, we would like to hear a few questions uh, posted to the, uh, uh, to the panelists, uh, maybe Brian and uh, Vani can post uh, the questions to our panelists from our participants. Okay, so uh, thank you, Prof. and Doctor. So here's a first question from participants. Maybe I can direct it to uh, Dr. Rusty. So uh, there's one, one person asking, is all antivenoms are readily available in all healthcare centers in Malaysia? And if it's not available, so how we should manage the snake uh snake bite at the moment okay i can answer about the stock not about the management maybe dr cardo or dr scott maybe dr Vika will be the better person to answer this but from the stock okay uh definitely there is a difference in the uh way we stock antivenoms it depends on the risk of envenoming it for the time being uh, for example, like me in Kuantan, we do have stocks because I know that we have stocks of cystic antivenom, quite a number of stocks for cystic antivenom because we have the risk of uh, cystic envenoming here. Uh, but we don't have quite, uh, don't have sufficient number of uh, viper, if not mistaken. Dr. Aljana, if he's here, maybe he can confirm. Uh, but I don't think so. We don't have, I don't think we have viper uh, stock in, the, in Kuantan. So there is definitely a different in. Uh, antivenom stock in different different facility okay uh, so that's why it's very important to know in your area what will be the most uh, possible uh, animals or uh, flora that can cause poisoning uh, so with that they, we as a pharmacist can plan and arrange the antidotes for the uh, whatever cases that you might encounter okay then for the second part maybe others can answer well, uh, I can just vouch that uh, in Malaysia since the past few years, since uh, let's say if you don't have the appropriate antivenom or appropriate antidote for certain uh, uh, poisoning or envenoming, uh, we can actually use our clinical uh, collaboration between centers to transfer uh, one or antidote to another antidote. And this is done uh, through pharmacies uh, uh, linkage uh, as well. So similar like uh, ICU, need for ICU. If you don't have enough ICU in your center, there could be other centers which have ICU, then the patient can go there. But in terms of antidote, rather than transporting patient, we change already our modus operandi. We are transporting the antidote, which is safer uh, for patient. Uh, and also, uh, I think, uh, uh, more cost effective. You know, patient can just be closer to their family rather than you know being transported elsewhere. Uh, so that, that, that uh, collaboration has been uh, established quite Quite some time, uh, so we have uh, so-called national, uh, you know, pharmacies uh, linkages for such uh, uh, for supplies, uh, and also we understand that certain big a bigger hospital will keep a, a bigger stock of uh, antidote compared to the smaller uh, hospitals. And as Dr. Rushdi said, uh, not all hospital require to keep all the antidotes or all the antivenom because of a difference in uh, distribution of. Uh, the fauna and flora that can cause harm in that area. Okay, for example, there's no need to keep a sea snake antivenom in Cameron Highland, uh, which is up on the mountain. You can't find sea snake, so why you want to keep sea snake? Just because uh, you have the list of sea snake in the blue book of pharmacies doesn't mean that you have to keep it in your hospital. So this is very much uh, requiring uh, you know more intelligent uh, deduction or intelligent uh, uh, you know uh, management of how you, you, you to 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 get your resources uh, better uh, distributed and used right? and minimize uh, wastage as well. Okay, good question. Uh, maybe Scott and uh, Ravika. Yeah, there might be one other yeah. thing to throw in on that, and that is that 
Um, whereas the definitive treatment for envenoming obviously is antivenom and the correct antivenom in the correct amounts given the correct way. There's also, if there's a great delay and if there's something like neostigmine around for uh, let's say postsynaptic neurotoxic envenoming and you have some neostigmine and some atropine around, that can actually be a life sustaining treatment, particularly with sea snakes where you might be on a boat and it might be very hard to get to the antivenom tea and get it supplied. And they are postsynaptic neurotoxicity and myotoxicity primarily. So that would be in some conditions that's helpful as is the absolutely critical essential skills of CPR and advanced life support, which can make an enormous difference in keeping the patient uh, stable for a period of time so that they are then in a condition to receive antivenom, which is a potentially life endangering treatment in some persons. So all of this has to be in place in order to appropriately manage the patient. Uh, Ravika, Ravika, any, any input from you? Um, I think uh, I, the only thing I'd like to add is um, just to highlight the principle that an antivenom is um, as far as antidotes, if you consider it to be an antidote, it's not an ideal antidote. And I think that's what Scott has been mentioning. And I think the key word when we look at antivenom is early administration. Of course, it has to be the correct antivenom and the correct dose. But I think the greatest misunderstanding that we need to clear is that the antivenom if administered at any time is going to reverse everything a patient is going to have. And I think that is the greatest a uh, pitfall um, that uh, doctors usually face. Um, they, they sort of uh, depend on antivenom in uh, an entire manner and in that, you know, sort of fear and desperation tend to forget uh, the other components of management. So we need to remember that antivenom, even uh, if, you know, it is appropriate to that given species, may not be able to reverse a number of uh, complications or a number of clinical manifestations, particularly if the patient has presented late to that center. So as far as situations like a coagulopathy are concerned, um, there is a lot of evidence that if you give antivenom early, appropriate for the species. In India, uh, the, the main snake species is Russell's viper. It does reverse, um, it does help uh, you know, give time for the liver to replace the clotting factors by mopping up venom. But at the same time, for the same snake, if, you know, if a person develops acute kidney injury, antivenom is not really good in preventing that or thrombotic microangiopathy. Similarly, if you look at crate bites, if you have a patient who has come after 12 hours to a center that has antivenom, he has already developed well-established neuroparalysis the antivenom is really not going to make a difference at that point. And rather than wasting time procuring antivenom, it's far more important to make sure that the patient is ventilated well. So I think the most important message that everyone should have is that antivenom is just one component of many other treatment components, which are of equal importance um, as far as the critical management of patients is concerned. So make sure that you do a thorough clinical examination. First, establish where a patient is envenomed or not. It is very important to go in a stepwise manner uh, rather than think of antivenom all at once. So if a person comes with a bite, the first thing to do is establish whether it is a snake bite or whether it is a bite by some other animal. Because our own experience at our poison center has been that people who have syndromes that are consistent with a scorpion sting uh, by the Indian red scorpion have been treated with snake antivenom and then have gone on to develop anaphylaxis. So I think what is very, very important is to have a very stepwise clinical approach where we look at a patient like any other medical patient, uh, rather than rushing and giving the person antivenom. So, and, and I feel that all those components, if done right, are still going to be, and will end up saving the patient, even if you don't have the antivenom. Uh, so, you know, establish that it is a snake bite, ask the question whether the patient is envenomed or not. If the patient is not envenomed, even if you have the antivenom for that species, there's really no indication of giving it. And if the patient is envenomed, then, you know, you need to find out what those symptoms are, then approach it based upon that syndrome that the patient has. And of course, for any emergency, you need to do a primary survey and you need to make sure that the patient is stable. So let's not waste time in, let's not have the antivenom question popping into our minds as soon as a patient comes, but rather making sure that that snake bite victim is stable. And if he is stable, he is calm, he is reassured, and then work him up and then decide whether you need antivenom.
and that's what I'd like to highlight. Uh, that's great because that's what is the difficulty that we had uh, before in trying to change this type of mindset uh, among a medical practitioner, especially the young ones. Uh, we had cases where they just give antivenin because they want to sleep at night because they were on call that day. You know, so that is kind of a very strange. Uh, and we just choose a polyvalent antivenin rather than just a specific antivenin just because you know, you know we, polyvalent is like you know magic bullet for everything. So <laughs> these are the things that uh, still plaguing uh, our medical care and we hope that by you know that's why the importance of this uh, topic being discussed even in at the medical student level so that when they become a doctor they have a bit of a cue in their mind uh, that these things cannot be just like you know uh, like a robot uh, uh, you know decision uh, they just without the AI they need to have more AI rather than just a mechanical uh, things to do so yeah so uh, next question maybe uh, very good thank you I think Scott wanted to say oh, yeah Scott, you want to you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Thanks, Ravikar. I actually had one thing to actually agree with Ravikar on something very, very uh, emphatically that he said, and that is that we, this is a discussion about how clinical toxinology is relevant to medical students, but at the same time, I want the medical students to keep something in mind, that there are some clinical toxinologists, in quotes, who do not practice medicine, and I mean are not touching patients anymore, and that is a in fact, I know a few who haven't touched the patient probably in their whole career. That is a dereliction of duty in my view, because as was stated, the thorough physical examination, methods of diagnosis, knowing medications and their interactions, which is relevant to pharmacy, such as Dr. Rusty pointed out, they, they, the different medications that patients come in, their comorbidities, all of that will influence how the envenomed patient will be treated, not only just by throwing our recognized antivenom, um, you know, panacea at them, which as was stated, isn't always effective, particularly when given late. So the management of a complicated affected patient with or without comorbidities, those skills have to be maintained and should not be allowed to degrade. It doesn't yeah, matter what area of medicine, doesn't matter yeah, what area. The clinical acumen is the most important. That's correct. Yeah, if you do that right as a medical student, you do uh, is hone your skills in clinical, uh, your patient hopefully will not die. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, so next question. Uh, okay, um, thank you, panelists. There's a question from the floor. Um, are we able to differentiate um, the types of snakes based on the biting scars? And if so, um, what happens if we administer the wrong antivenom? Uh, May I direct the question to uh, Prof. Scott first? Well, I mean, everybody here can comment on this, but there's been a great emphasis already about the importance of specificity towards the provision of the right antivenom at the right time in the right amount in the right manner and for the correct species. This is also why this is an unusual field. And that's because kind of like in parasitology that was brought up, which is maybe why something has been linked occasionally and microbiology, with the wrong antibiotic, you can pile all the antibiotics in for some bugs all you want. You're not going to produce a static or cytal effect. The same thing here. There are some species of snakes that have antigenic uh, identity with their major medically important toxins. We know some of them and many we don't. So we know that some antivenoms have paraspecificity for other venoms and their, their level of provision of those antivenoms might vary according to the amount of neutralizing titer of antibody that's present in a given antivenom itself. So it's important to know something about the animals, which has been emphasized by everybody on the panel. It's important to know something about their venoms. This is different than just knowing this snake goes with that antivenom because it's not just a one-to-one -one circumstance. So one has to understand in some cases, the antivenom may not work even for the species it's defined because there's very vari variability among populations and individuals and they could vary. And I'll give you one quick example and then let the other panelists, opinion. we could go on for hours on this. So I'm just gonna give this brief thing. In, for example, in the state of Arizona in the United States, we have a rattlesnake, Crotalus scutulatus, the Mojave rattlesnake. It has three different types of venom. This is exactly the same snake taxonomically. So if you do scale counts, you do crown scutulation, you do every aspect, iso, uh, isoenzyme, 
electrophoresis, you do DNA studies, you will find they're identical with a few little differences. But yet one group in one part of Arizona produces a potent presynaptic neurotoxin called Mojave toxin. It could be up to 40% of the venom protein. And that means antivenom, if not given early, and may not even be effective at all because of the presynaptic rapid effect, like with Bungaris, like with crite bites. They often require intubation, regardless of all the antivenom you pour into them, it doesn't matter. And it de degenerates the motor end plate. Then if you go to another part of the state, you got the same snake, there's no Mojave toxin. So what you get is a coagulopathy and some myotoxicity. The same exact snake, same state, two different locations, totally different venoms. Antivenom works in one, antivenom is very poorly effective in the other. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that is where, uh, you know, you, you, sh you should kind of uh, have the idea of uh, contacting the right person. If let's say you are giving the wrong antivenom, what you should do is where to get the right information. Uh, you know that you have a support system to help you, uh, to help you really uh, finding the uh, issue if there is any failure of therapy. So uh, to provide the appropriate uh, options uh, after that uh, failure of therapy. So we had cases where people are given the wrong antivenom uh, and they're wondering why it doesn't work. Uh, obviously, because it's the wrong antivenom. So uh, yeah, uh, and patient can die from that. Uh, either both uh, of failure of therapy or from the subsequent uh, uh, side effects of the uh, antivenom itself. Okay, so uh, maybe next question. We have a lot more questions to, that has come in. Yes, okay. So I would like to open this question to all our panelists because this question is about um, what are the challenges faced in, uh, uh, in our panel panelists' respective countries in regards to managing patients who refuse medical treatment. For example, they have their, uh, due to their own religious belief or their preference on self-treating. Maybe Prof. Ravika first on this. There's no short answer to this question. No. Uh, uh, well, there are a number of challenges that we face. Um, some of the challenges are to do with uh, people accessing care. And then there are some challenges that are to do with the quality of care that is available. And it's this combination that actually results in uh, the significantly large number of snake bite deaths that you see in India. Uh, India continues to have the largest number of snake bite deaths in the world with a recent study showing that there are up to 58,000 uh, people who die of snake bites every year uh, in India. Uh, so I, I really can sort of, it's difficult for me to shorten this answer, but what I'd like to say is that there are a number of deeply entrenched problems in India. One is from, uh, you know, the view of the patients themselves. There are a substantial number of patients, not only in India and South Asia as a whole, uh, who tend to prefer to first access traditional uh, healers. Um, who then are, uh, you know, and they are given a number of different traditional remedies. Some of them can themselves, uh, you know, create side effects and contribute to death. Uh, but most importantly, it results in critical time being wasted. Um, and of course, this is further worsened by the fact that access to a hospital can be difficult in some places. So it's not the fault of the patient. The earliest person he can reach is a traditional healer. So there is no simple answer to this. If, if you know you have a hospital that's really far off and the best that the person can do is reach a traditional healer, there's really nothing that he's going to do. So that's the first challenge, access to care because of remote facilities. The second is when they reach hospitals, many of these hospitals are primary health centers. These are overcrowded. The number of patients that are seen by each doctor is overwhelming. Doctors have on an average very short periods of time that they can spend with the patient and they are then forced to do a very rapid assessment. Combined with that is the issue that we are discussing right now, which is knowledge, clinical assessment is lacking. So you can imagine that when a person comes with a snake bite, there's no time, there's no assessment, he's just given antivenom. Then is the problem with the antivenom itself. There are a number of issues with antivenom quality. Indian antivenom in general is not very safe. Um, it is associated with a large number of um, uh, side effects, anaphylactic reactions, which again makes doctors in smaller hospitals very wary. So even if you have a small hospital that is stocked with antivenom, a doctor would prefer not to give the antivenom because he's so scared that he won't be able to manage the anaphylaxis that occurs. So invariably what happens is that these are patients who are referred. Okay, so a patient comes to a primary center, he's not treated, 
He is then referred and then he goes to two other primary centers and finally reaches a hospital where he's developed, by which time he's already developed, uh, you know, complications that might not be reversed by an antibody. Uh, so that's another challenge that is there. So these are, in summary, the most important challenges. Of course, uh, when you look at government hospitals, antivenom is subsidized in many states of India, so that's not a problem. Uh, the, the main problems are to do with access and quality of care that is available. Yeah, exactly. So we had the same kind of uh, uh, issue as well. As you can see, uh, some study in Laos, uh, where people don't want to come to hospital because every patient who got a snake bite died in the hospital. <laughs> because of they didn't have the appropriate treatment care, but after they have obtained the antivenom, the patient survived and they went home and uh, people see that they are still alive and well, and then people start to come to the hospital after that. So this is uh, you know, how the public, uh, the perception of public about uh, how good your healthcare service is uh, going to change how uh, things are going to be practiced. And we still have issue with uh, myth uh, in the public uh, about how to treat, uh, for example, in the first aid and so on, and using uh, traditional care. And uh, from our recent study of our, uh, one of my students' uh, study is that we find that sometimes this is not just about how intelligent or how educated a person is. Uh, we see that uh, the most educated group is the one that actually going to the, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, doing the, uh, the wrong uh, treatment uh, option. So this is very strange, you know, uh, we can't just say that if somebody goes to university, they will go to the hospital, you know? they probably the first one to go to the uh, health, uh, you know, to, to, to the, the, the traditional healer uh, for whatever belief. And this is happening in modern Malaysia too, uh, but in, in a very small number, because we are actually from our experience in managing patients in rural area, People, uh, the, 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 the Aborigines, uh, the people who are living in the forest, because of the system uh, works uh, quite close to their community, they even uh, they will actually go and seek for uh, uh, proper health care, even though they are supposedly a very traditional uh, community, right? Uh, but they still go to the hospital because of the service being provided and the way that the service is being promoted to them, uh, their community is very good. So, uh, yeah. So that's about excess. Uh, thank you so much. Anybody else would like to add anything or can we move to the next question? Just one, one last very quick comment. And that is that there's an unfortunate aspect in many parts of medicine with underserved communities where people will walk in and just attempt to enforce their, uh, a, a kind of standard definition of the practice on a group of people who have completely different presuppositions and it's a very uh, culturally hostile way to approach groups like this. So I think one thing we really need is to become far more ethnically and culturally sensitive in approaching peoples who have rejected allopathic techniques because of something they've heard or somebody who's gone to the town and been treated and they get scared and we need to approach them in a much more uh, sensitive and affable manner. That's all. It's something we can learn from the current pandemic. The issue, exactly. yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, right. Next question. Okay, uh, the next question. This question: um, What are the criteria needed for a country to produce its own antivenom, and will Malaysia be producing our own antivenom in the future? As uh, we know that um, the antivenoms that we have in Malaysia are uh, from Thailand, and also we also uh, obtain some from Australia. Yeah, Dr. Rushdi maybe can answer this. I can answer uh, on the antivenom production. Uh, we use, Malaysia used to be one of the antivenom producer until 1989. Uh, when after 1989, the production, uh, back then it was under Institute of Medical Research. It was stopped due to, I think, because of the economic uh, crisis at the time. So, and if I'm not mistaken, it's also because the number of bites is not that significant, which, and, and also at the time, it's a lot cheaper to buy antivenom from other sources, like from India, from Thailand. And that's the reason why we don't have any more uh, anti, uh, antivenom production here in Malaysia. Okay, back then the production was in Perlis. If you, if you go to Perlis, uh, there's a state farm. Back then, there used to be horses over there 
where they harvest the serum and bring back to uh, KL, I, I, IMR KL. Okay, but they cease operation since 19, uh, 1989. Okay, is there any possibility of producing anti venom? Mm, there are many groups now who now uh, doing a lot of work uh, using uh, cell culture and new um, biotechnology technique to produce anti venom. Uh, it is possible to do it here. I think we do have the technology, maybe not as a in a big scale for the time being, but we do have, we do have the expertise and the technology here. The problem is the demand. Uh, now, if you ask me, it's a lot cheaper to buy from Thailand. One vial of the venom, it costs like $40. Instead of making from biotechnology pro, uh, technique, maybe it costs hundreds of dollars per vial. Uh, and then we don't know how potent it is. Okay, So for the time being, uh, I don't see it will happen especially when we don't have the capability of raising uh, horses in the GMP plant. GMP plant will require a lot of specification. That happened with the Moroccan counterpart. So at, in the Morocco, they don't have the funding to do GMP certified plant for antibody production. That's why they closed down the, uh, the uh, anti, anti venom production in Morocco. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I think that's it. Is that, is, that's all about for me. I think. Uh, yeah, that, I think. that's good. Uh, yeah, I just add a bit more. That that that. Uh, uh, in terms of numbers, is going to be a lot. Uh, you know, it, it, as we all know, snake bite of antivenom is not going to be a money making uh, business uh, like other drugs, and that's why some some manufacturers pull out in terms of man providing uh, uh, antivenoms. Uh, for example, in the recent Africa situation, but. Um, uh, for our region, in terms of ASEAN, we actually already moving towards uh, sharing resources as well. So uh, we are actually trying to ensure that our own stock, uh, those who are manufacturing antivenom, are still able to do it to supply other countries around them. First, their own country, and if they have access, is able to uh, share with the other countries. And the primary uh, goal is for them to supply for their own people, but uh, we're looking at in terms of uh, supporting others in the region uh, is to have sufficient stock. So that's where we come up with a recent study about uh, the burden on, uh, of snake bite uh, and also antivenom access, uh, which is recently published in BMJ. And we are actually having a consortium now called the Pan ASEAN Antivenom. Uh, 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 antivenom uh, consortium, where we look at also possibility of uh, improving the current uh, production of antivenom in terms of coverage or neutralization uh, power of the antivenom to cover for most of the species in the region and how we can actually help to improve that. We have not really able to produce our own, but from existing uh, manufacturers, maybe we can supply them our venom and they can actually add on and uh, you know broaden the, 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 the coverage for the antivenom that they produce. So we're still far away from that. And, and as Dr. Rushdie Rushdi said, there are other methods now being looked at and how uh, the traditional production of uh, antivenom may, uh, may have an other options rather than antibody production. They could have some other uh, you know, immunological techniques uh, 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 in, in the making. So, um, and I would like to inform also because of the uh, so-called awareness, uh, there's a WHO awareness about snake bite, the possibility of number of cases may go down. As a target is actually to reduce or minimize the number of uh, snake bite in the country. So if you have minimized number of cases in a country, your need for antivenom may also reduce. And therefore your current production stock, uh, net production, can be utilized for uh, helping other countries. Uh, on top of that, we are also looking at sharing uh, uh, or using uh, expired antivenom, which are still okay. So this is also another area where we look at, where we have done a few uh, efforts in terms of Rex ASEAN, uh, where we share some of our, uh, uh, what you call expired antivenom, but still within uh, you know, good condition of stock. Uh, so they are able to use it for their patients. Uh, uh, when they did not have uh, the antivenom available, the, the unexpired one, and it works well. So, you know, this is another effort that we're looking at and how do we, you know, minimize wastage 
uh, which stage of uh, the appropriate antivenom. Okay, so that's all from me. A any other questions or right. anybody yeah, else would like to add? Just one comment and on, to add on to that, and that is from a global perspective, there are some uh, global areas that require a unique antivenom for their flora. An example is Sri Lanka with Hypnali species where they've been tr uh, attempted to have used several different Indian antivenoms, including half kind, which are totally ineffective and really require a specific antivenom against it, which is why in Costa Rica, ICP has gone on to do, do a very, very uh, noble cause, I, I, as Cal said, always at a loss of money uh, to try to stock some unique antivenoms to places that do not have any, that have novel antigenic uh, uh, venoms that are medically significant. Okay, next question, I see. Okay, so uh, here's one more question. So, uh, do all patients who have been bitten, uh, bitten by a snake and have experienced both local and systemic envenomation needed a follow-up in hospital after being treated or discharged? Uh, not everyone, uh, because if you are bitten by a non-venomous snake, obviously you don't need to be uh, really emitted. So that's where identification of snake is uh, going to play a role uh, in actually, uh, you know, providing the appropriate care for patient. If patient doesn't need to be hospitalized because the snake is not venomous. Uh, you don't need to even uh, poke a patient uh, to take blood or, you, you know, uh, unnecessary admission to hospital. So uh, no, the answer is not all snake bite patients require uh, hospitalization. It based on how uh, the identification process, the assessment of patient and uh, how the patient progress. Uh, you know, so not all patients are actually uh, and venom. Uh, even they were bitten by a venomous snake doesn't mean that 100% that they will be and venom and require antivenom, okay? Anybody else would like to add? Or can we move on to the next question? Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next question. So um, there's a question in regards to um, uh, about the Brookmanshire species. The species was mentioned in Prof. Carlton's lecture, uh, quoted used in kidnaps. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we know how Brookmanshire is used in such cases? Uh, well, I will not tell you because you might apply it to kidnap your, you know, the love of your life. But <laughs> uh, the science is about is a, a scopolamine. Eh? Brookmansia is uh, what we call angel's trumpet. Uh, it, it is, you can find it uh, in, in, in many tropical countries, including Malaysia. They're imported. Uh, you can go to Cameron Highlands. You can find it uh, also there. Uh, but maybe Prof. Scott would like to give a perspective about uh, the use of uh, plant toxins uh in criminal acts uh, maybe prof scott has a bit more or ravika you know india has also have a very strong history about uh, uh, uh homeopathy and also uh, you know herbal remedies uh, some people use it for uh criminal or some self-inflicting uh re reason so let's let's get their perspective on this I mean, from my perspective, just the main thing that is as blatant and right is, is again, going back to Sri Lanka is oleandrin. Oleander is one of the major causes of self-harm among adolescent um, uh, population. So it's actually one of the more uh, commonly used uh, accessible forms of suicide attempts. And that's something to really keep in mind because it's a cardiac glycoside and you'd be treating it with digoxin antibody if you see it. And, and which is very expensive. And, um, and you have to keep this in mind if you have some patients in certain type of, um, uh, how can I put this, in some kind of a state that come in in pathological states, to have that run through your mind, is this a natural agent? Is this just something different than uh, something I would normally see purchased through a dealer on the corner with, in a paper bag? Because there are other means of kind of these poisonings that occur other than the drugs that we know from street drug inventories. Uh, Ravika? Uh, well, we have a lot of plant poisons in India. Um, uh, like Scott said, most clinical settings are deliberate self-harms. We don't have um, uh, situations where people are abducted with plant poisons, but 
Um, there's a lot of deliberate self-harm. Oleander, again, because Sri Lanka and South India are very close by, Oleander is a very, very important species. Uh, we do get a sizable number of patients with Oleander poisoning, um, uh, which has effects very similar to the Joxin overdose. Uh, we also have more local indigenous species, uh, something that is not found in other parts of South Asia, a plant called Clistanthus colinus, uh, which is a nephrotoxicant. Um, patients usually present with refractory hypokalemia and then um, they die of a cardiac arrest. Um, we do get some uh, deliriant plant poisons as well. Uh, Brugdansia is not common in South India. What we get is the Thura. The Thura stromonium, the Jimson weed. Um, patients usually present with a delirium toxidrome, extremely, of course, at very, very high um, doses, they can become comatose, but the vast majority of them are extremely agitated. Um, um, uh, I think, as Scott mentioned, it's important to actually be able to differentiate these in the midst of an emergency setting, when a person comes to you with, um, you know, something that is very atypical or comes to you with um, uh, a neurotoxic syndrome, uh, sometimes people miss the fact that it could be a toxin. Um, uh, and so I think that should be a very important um, uh, differential as well. Another very interesting thing that we do get is, um, is uh, Gloriosa superba poisoning the glory lily, which uh, is a cytotoxic agent. Uh, most patients actually come with a cytotoxic syndrome uh, where they actually have this diarrhea and vomiting and nausea that goes on for a day. Then they are well and they are discharged and then they come back with severe pancytopenia. Most of them actually are treated for, uh, you know, a gastrointestinal infectious disease rather than this entire question of whether they could have ingested a plant just doesn't come up. Uh, so it's extremely important to have um, a toxin in the list of your differential diagnosis. Uh, when you see a patient who presents with, you know, weight syndromes, or even in a routine case, it's always important to cover a toxin as one of your differentials. Uh, Dr. Rushdi, any plant poisoning uh, you want to talk about? Uh, I think, yeah, the, the, the uh, plant poisoning is quite interesting too because who was like the devil trumpets? I don't know whether you know because in some part of the country, it is used for joint pain. All right, uh, so uh, I don't know how is the how high is the incidence of poisoning by the devil trumpet, but of course, there is always a risk, especially when you're talking about the ornamental plants. Especially now we have yam. Everybody is crazy about yam now. Yams are is they are the glucosides in yam which can cause poisoning. Okay, people think it as a harmless. Okay, but apparently it, it is a. They are basically very poisonous plants which we keep in the house, which can basically become a danger, not to ourselves, even to our pets. Uh, so that what we need to be. Uh, rem remind it to the public. Okay, that's all for me. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, for example, also people are using a lot of uh, uh, kratom. You know, kratom uh, it used to be just to increase uh, stimulant, but uh, becomes a, so such a, a problem with uh, abuse, and therefore it's being uh, uh, you know uh, not made legal. It's illegal. So anyway, we'll discuss about more about plants uh, uh, this uh, on the thirtieth, where we're going to have a discussion about plant poisoning and uh, herbal remedies uh, with the uh, National Poison Center. It's going to be a webinar also on that. So join us then. Okay. Uh, yeah. So next uh, question, perhaps. Uh, for the Brugmansia, you can look up what uh, effects of scopolamine is. Uh, that's where it comes, uh, you know, how it affects uh, uh, your mind. Huh? It's a truth <laughs> drug. <laughs> anyway, uh, have a look. Okay, so actually there's one last question. So um, may I know what are the important clinical and laboratory parameters that need to be monitored in case of Envenomation, and I suppose that it has to depend on the, like the type of uh the toxin related disease, but uh maybe uh any doc prof or doctor can maybe brief us on like the general from the general practice. Uh, 
Yeah, okay. So uh, you see, uh, when you get a case of a bite, uh, that's where your history comes in, uh, medical history. Clinical history is very important. Uh, that will give you some idea. But not all patients will bring the appropriate snake uh, to you, uh, the, the one that bit them. Some, most of them are actually unidentified snake bites. So from the word go, you are already in the dark. Uh, but what you have is actually the clinical acumen as a medical uh, personnel to ask the accurate as much as possible, the history, to go through each details. And that will lead you to possible, what we call intelligent deduction of a possible cause. And that will perhaps then uh, help you in identifying which appropriate uh, investigations uh, that should be done for this patient. And that includes uh, blood tests. So not all patients require um, blood tests, uh, obviously, uh, but some with uh, physical symptoms or clinical symptoms that is uh, progressing, that you may want to do certain uh, what you call blood tests. Uh, I know there are a lot of uh, uh, so-called uh, very general uh, ass assumption that you know you do blood tests for every patient, uh, all blood tests for every patient. That's not true in our situation in Malaysia for because we know what are the snakes in the country that can cause uh, blood uh, uh, derangement, right? So we only choose certain uh, which uh, blood test that is required uh, for such patients. So in Malaysia, uh, we generally divided into states that can cause coagulopathy, can cause cytotoxicity, and can cause uh, issue with uh, renal function, uh, breakdown of tissues, uh, rhabdomyolysis. Uh, generally, neurotoxic snakes, there's no blood test that is required. So these are very limited to those which can cause uh, tissue destruction or uh, uh, what you call a uh, uh, affecting their cells, uh, such as blood tests, uh, blood cells. So FPC, full blood count uh, that we do normally, tissue lysis and so on, we can look at the CK level uh, and for rhabdomyolysis, for example. And uh, in general, we look at the uh, coagulopathy uh, issue is in the coagulation profile. Uh, in, and remind you, in the other part of the coagulation profile, the coagulation issue that we look at is the platelet count. So patient can cause thrombocytopenia. So full blood, count, full blood count contains a platelet count. So that will help in uh, what you call looking at patient. What I think most importantly is not to rely on the first blood test that you get. It's actually you need to do this in serial manner. So that's why in our guideline, uh, we say that we do every six hours so that we can see the trend. And the trend should follow the physical finding as well. If there's a painful progressive swelling, then of course uh, it will follow that there is possibility of uh, ongoing uh, hand venoming uh, process and that will affect the uh, blood test. And if let's say you give antivenom for the patient, there was an indication for antivenom, you can still proceed with the same blood test and you will see that you should be able to see the improvement of the uh, blood test parameters to suggest that your treatment is successful. Okay, so blood tests cannot just be done once, you have to do it serially. Uh, closely related to the physical finding. And this is all actually uh, typical clinical, uh, best clinical practice uh, for patient, okay? So don't just do blood tests because of, uh, you know, defensive medicine, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's all from me. Maybe other comments from other uh, panelists about this? I would, I, one thing, I guess I would add one thing, and that is, in some clinics, like we've talked in places that don't have instrument instrumentation, um, it's important to do what you can just to get a sense. If you suspect someone is seriously in venom with a coagulopathic uh, snake bite, sometimes just a whole blood clotting test 20 done in the right vessel and uh, assessed in the correct manner, usually with a control from a healthy volunteer run parallel, can give you information as can just a urine dipstick to give you an idea whether you have an impending AKI from an increasing amount of protein from your admission uh, dip to a dip done a few hours later. That's all I did. I think uh, I'd agree with what Scott has said. I think this answer actually depends upon two things. One is the setting, and the other thing is how sick a patient is. Uh, that is what is going to determine the type of tests. Uh, if it's a very small primary health center, the absolute necessary test as far as India is concerned is a whole blood, a 20 minute whole blood clotting test because we need to also remember that coagulopathies can be initially 
um, they may not have clinical manifestations. Um, and the only thing that is going to tell you that a person has a coagulopathy could be a positive 20 WBCT. And that would actually help with early antivenom. So that's the first point. Uh, however, if you have a, a healthcare setting where laboratory facilities are available, um, and I'm sure that this would vary from region to region, as far as South Asia is concerned, the important test that we would sort of think about would be a complete blood count. We would get a creatinine and urea done, um, um, as well as uh, maybe coagulation studies, which are not necessary. We use a 20 WBCT to determine whether a patient requires antivenom or not, whether he's progressing. But you can have patients in very large centers. There may be research organizations and so on. In which setting, perhaps coagulation profiles may be required, but not otherwise. Um, like Scott said, other simpler tests can help. Suppose you do not have a laboratory that has uh, facilities for even measuring electrolytes. A simple ECG can uh, you know, show you signs of hyperkalemia. Um, but of course, it all depends because if a person has developed features that could suggest that he's had an intracranial bleed, then you would obviously require facilities for imaging and things like that. So it all depends upon the setting that you're in. Um, and I think testing should be prioritized based upon the availability of tests as well as how sick a patient is. Okay, I think I think that's all that we have uh, done. So we back, go back to our moderators uh, to proceed with the next uh, program. Okay, uh, thank you panelists uh, for enlightening us. So next we'll proceed with a quiz session. For Anybody else want to join? There'll be a prize at the end. Uh, it's a very interesting book, a signed copy of Prof. Scott's book. Uh, I think we'll start. Okay. All the best. So we have, is that a final or oh, still going on? Oh, okay. Congratulations. A163213. Okay. A163213. Uh, can the person okay. just speak up? Afternoon, Prof. Uh, hi. Congratulations. Who is that? Uh, Lynn. Oh, okay. Happy New Year. Anyway. <laughs> so, can just share the link uh, of the, 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 the book in the chat so others can see what she wants. Okay. Okay. So, I think uh, now. Uh, we have ended our session, but before the closing, we have went, we would like to invite Dr. Sabrina, who is the uh, President of Malaysian Society on Toxinology and also the acting in charge of Special Interest Group on in Clinical Toxinology from College of Emergency Physicians to give us a few words before we uh, end our event. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a uh, very good day uh, to all. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to the main organizer, uh, the Department of Emergency Medicine, Faculty of Medicine UKM, um, for um, uh, doing this web webinar. And thank you for inviting us, uh, the Clinical Toxinology, SIG, CEP, MST, and also REX, as the co-organizer of this webinar. And uh, thank you also to the presenter, the moderator, and the panelists for the insights and also the knowledge that uh, been shared to us. So I personally learned a lot from this uh, webinar as well. So personally, I think um, I do think that clinical toxinology is a timely relevant for all the medical students, even in uh, uh, for us in Perak. Uh, we also started to introduce uh, this, uh, uh, um, I mean, curriculum in, in our uh, for our students here, and um, it is important so that when the cases uh, comes into us, regardless in the primary healthcare setting or emergency departments, we are ready to manage the patients, our patients actually comprehensively. Um, and evidence-based medicine for clinical toxinology are emerging and hopefully uh, this EBM can help in the, uh, the, the medical practitioner uh, like us to manage the patient appropriately. So lastly, congratulations to the group for successfully conducting this webinar and hopefully all of us can gather a lot of learning points from this webinar. So uh, inshallah, 
Uh, thank you, and again, congratulations. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sabrina. So, uh, uh, so finally, you, we are come to an end for our webinar. So, I would like to thanks again for the for our uh, doctor advisor, uh, uh, Prof. Khan, and also our Dr. Munawa, and also our uh, panelists, we have Prof. Scott, uh, Prof. Rebecca, and also Dr. Rusty. And so, not to forget our collaborate, uh, the person in charge of, of our collaborators, which are. Uh, from the Malaysian Toxinology, uh, Malaysian Society on Toxinology, and also the uh, RECS, and also the um, uh, Special Interest Group of, of the College of uh, Emergency Physicians. So, uh, before we end our event, I uh, would like to promote a few uh, upcoming events. So, to allow me to share, uh, share with you get, uh, the participants for our upcoming events. So here's one, clinical toxinology on marine poisoning also and venoming, we have, which will be held on, hold on the 20 April 2022. And also there's another one on uh, health and safety measure for stack related injuries in Malaysia on the 23rd of April. And then one more on national stroke brain round, but this is only allowed for the healthcare personals only, professionals only. Then uh, here's one more. Of uh, the militators on tumbuhan dengan kasat perubatan manfaat atau mudarat. Okay. So before the participants uh, leave the Zoom meeting, right, you all to scan the QR code to gain to uh, to gain the e certificate and also the as the attendance. Thank you. So I really enjoyed myself uh, with the panelists. Thank you so much, uh, Scott, uh, Ravika, and uh, Rushdi for entertaining us this afternoon. <laughs> uh, hopefully we can uh, you know, enjoy, uh, do this again uh, with the support of uh, MST uh, and uh, the college. Now we have the College of Emergency Physician, uh, SIG, uh, Clinical Toxinology. So it's just been uh, recognized and uh, you know, uh, acknowledged uh, as a special uh, as a sub specialty or a special interest group. Uh, uh, park under the college. So that is a big uh, boost uh, to us in Malaysia uh, so that we can pursue this uh, uh, in a more uh, organized manner and uh, recognize. The most important is being recognized. Uh, so uh, that will actually uh, help improve uh, our patient's care uh, better. So yeah, congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Sabrina, uh, for gracing our uh, program today. That's fantastic. Okay, with that, uh, that's all. Thank you so much, our two moderator, our moderators uh, for for this. Uh, it's a medical student uh, effort, which is something which is I'm, I'm really proud of uh, to say. Uh, so uh, it's really a, a booster <laughs> session, uh, just a boring lecture into something like this. It's just you know it's international as well, so that kind of uh, you know provide some global thinking uh, in our students. Uh, uh, you know, a medical student in UKM. So that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, take Thank care. You, Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. and Doctor. It's our honor to have you all here. Thank you. Thank you very Goodbye. much. Take care. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Doctor. Bye. Bye.